Today on Real Ghost Stories Online, why was her daughter seeing shadows and figures that no one else could see? This is Real Ghost Stories Online. Hey, it is. And if you have a real ghost story, you can share it with us. If you want to call it in, the number is 855-853-4802. Write in at realghoststoriesonline.com. And you can become a premium subscriber if you want to. You get advanced episodes, access to the archive, no commercials. You can try it for three days free through Apple Podcasts or go to patreon.com slash real ghost stories or go to ghostpodcast.com. I'm Carol Hughes and my sister, Kathy Gordon's here, just flew in and boy, are your arms tired. <laughs> Man, they are. Oh. oh, oh my gosh. Yes, I went to Oregon. And now she's back. And I would say... I think Oregon might be the prettiest place I've ever been to. Oh, my God. The photos that you guys shared. Oh, I tell you. That so place. my nephew, your son, lives in Tillamook. He lives outside of Tillamook in a little town right out along the coast there. And so, like, if like there's a highway there. So one side's mm-hmm. the ocean, the other side's mountains. It's mm-hmm. so pretty. It is absolutely stunningly beautiful. And the first day I got there, it was sunny and beautiful. And um, then the second day, it it rained, but that was its own beauty. I loved that day because, you know, it was just a pretty drizzly day all day. Yeah. And we still went to the beach and walked the beach anyway. And it was just really gorgeous. And yeah, I have to say... Of all the places I've ever been, it may be the most beautiful place I've ever been. It was stunning. I can't wait to go visit. Yeah, it was so stunning. I'm glad that you went. Yeah. Two out of three kids, great. that ain't bad. Yeah, I had, see- yeah, I had my other son there with me too, so. <laughs> that doesn't yeah. happen very often in your life. <laughs> well, I bet like that whole time you were gone, I bet you were like, man, I wish I could talk ghosts with Carol. Well, you're in luck because today we're going to talk about ghosts and Here stuff like that. That's what I was thinking the whole time. It's like, if only, if only I had time to do that. So here's our first story today. It says, my daughter Lexi was a bright and bubbly girl who had always been sensitive to the spiritual world around her. From a young age, she would talk about seeing shadows and figures that no one else could see. But as she got older, her ability to see those entities became more intense and frightening, which is kind of weird because a lot of times that's it's as the other they way get around. older. Yeah. yeah. It started with her waking up in the middle of the night, claiming dark figures were lurking in her room. She would often be terrified to go to sleep, insisting that the demons were watching her every move. Oh, my God. I would hate that. Yeah. Like. Awful. I can't imagine trying to go to bed every night thinking that. Ugh. These shadows eventually evolved into full-on detailed demons, and how she described them was scary. I did experience some myself with some sleep paralysis. As her parents, my husband and I were at a loss for how to get my daughter through this ordeal. We turned to close friends and family for support, seeking advice from anyone with experience dealing with the supernatural. Some suggested seeking help from a medium or psychic, while others recommended cleansing rituals or protective talismans. But in the end, our faith in God gave us the strength to face this challenge head on. We spent countless nights praying with Lexi, asking for protection and guidance from a higher power. Slowly but surely, the dark figures faded away and Lexi's fears fears started to subside. With time, she was able to sleep peacefully through the night once again, free from the constant torment of the demons. It was a difficult journey that brought our family closer together and strengthened our face in the and strengthened our faith in the power of love and support. While we may never fully understand the mysteries of the spiritual world, we know that with the help of our friends, family, and God, we can overcome anything that comes our way. I want the opportunity to share our family's story in the hopes that it encourages others going through this and that they are not alone. It has been a slow recovery in the images of my daughter, and I still see from time to time still haunt us. So they still must... Sometimes, maybe. Yeah, the images my daughter and I still see from time to time still haunt us. So maybe there's a little thing going on. 
We don't know for sure what started this, but we have since written a book about our experiences and hope this doesn't happen to anyone else because it truly has traumatized our lives. Thank you for reading my short introduction to my story. Please reach out to me for more information or questions about our experience. Although words will never do it real justice about how terrifying our lives were, nowhere was safe, especially for Lexi. This is something that most people don't even believe in, and it was taking over our world with no end in sight, Brandy. So after reading that, now I'm like, mm-hmm. I guess I need to read the book. Yeah. I should reach out to Brandy and see, I should get the book, reach out to her and maybe do an episode on the Grave Talks. That could be kind of mm-hmm. interesting to dive into that. Yeah. Because there's not a lot of story to this story. Like, I know they we prayed don't have any with specifics. her. They prayed with her, but, you know, a mm-hmm. lot of people have done that and that hasn't helped. And mm-hmm. the, You know, the only thing that she never mentioned that they tried that I... I mean, I would have at some point was regular therapy. Maybe a therapist could delve into this and see if there were other reasons. Because sometimes mental illness in itself, you know, will have you seeing visions and terrors and and horrible things. And so, you know, I would have just ruled that out. Anything medical, you know, anything that could... Or sometimes therapists can just give you techniques to help you deal with things too, and well, you know, and there's PTSD issues that would go with right. that. And so I, so that would have been maybe another avenue that I would have looked at too, and that I would recommend in a lot of situations uh, go to a medical professional and see if there's anything that's you know physically causing this because. You know, hallucinations and things like that. They can come from different things, chemical mm-hmm. imbalances in your body and like all sorts of things can happen. And um, and I'm certainly not an expert in that, but I, I don't think it would hurt to try that avenue if anyone else is out there, you know, struggling. And when she says still see images from time to time, is that like a flashback image? Mm-hmm. Or are is they it... actually seeing apparitions that are in the yeah. room? Because if you're still seeing the apparitions, I wouldn't be so sure that the problem solved. Mm-hmm. I would be wary of mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying that it's not true, anything like that. But but you want to look at all possibilities, well, I would think after going through something that terrifying, you would need some counseling. Mm-hmm. You, how do you deal with that? Yeah, and and that's what these people do, is help people deal with things. And, you know, they're not standing there in judgment. That's not their job. Their job is to help you, you know, sort through and figure out what's going on and how to, you know, move from there and give you techniques to do things. So I think... um you know, that that would just be a, a, another you know, road to take. It does remind me of that episode of the Grave Talks that I did with the couple that bought the house that was very haunted, mm-hmm. like in an evil way. And they um, ended up, because they were people of faith, but their faith wasn't helping them in that. And so they... Um, reached out to somebody who contacted somebody and they found a a church family where people actually in the church had experience with this and had done this before and they came into the house and Mm -hmm. helped them with it. Mm -hmm. You know, so... So there may be other like denominations that work more directly with this too. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if Brandy found something like that or... Because, you know, you hear the stories all the time of people praying and praying and praying, and it's not going away. And I don't know. I think there's times that's like, whoa, this is out of my pay grade. Right. Right. But I don't like that whole, like, dealing with demons. It's one thing when it's a ghost, but whenever I hear a story about demons, that just creeps me out. Yeah. So I might reach out to Brandy and see if I can get Mm -hmm. the book and read it and... Because then you'd have more specific instances yeah. of things. And then we can follow up here. Mm-hmm. Do, so, yeah. So, Brandy, if you're listening, I'll reach out to you. Because I would like to know more. There's not mm-hmm. a lot of detail in that exactly. story. Yeah. Like, okay, you prayed with her, but more went down. Because mm-hmm. it's never that easy. 
Right. Never that easy. Okay, well, let's go to a phone call. I have a story that I found out about when I was just nine years old. My mom had told me it started with her. And then, um, you know, the, the haunting or ghost spirit, whatever it was, followed her. So I have a few stories that start really before I was even born. Um, so when my mom was growing up, when she still lived with her parents and her siblings, they lived in a house that they all knew was haunted. It wasn't a, a bad ghost, she said. It, you know, was, you know, never harmed anyone or <clears throat> really did much. But, you know, they would hear the steps up the stairs. The water would turn on and off, just things like that. So they knew something was there. However, when they had moved, the people who moved into their childhood home tried to sue my grandmother for selling them a quote unquote haunted house, which you can't even do. Um, apparently when they moved in, the spirits that were there didn't like the new people. So they'd open and close the windows, just make a ruckus. So um, that's where it kind of all started. When I was just born until six months old, we lived in a certain house and then we moved. So this first house that I was born in is where this um, dark entity started. My mother told me that she would see this black figure with a cloak and a hat, like a top hat. And my dad did not believe it. So one day she said, okay, Joe, go get me a glass of water in the kitchen. Because she knew it was over there. And he literally dropped the glass and it broke because he saw it for his own eyes and, you know, believed her. So one time my grandma was babysitting us while my parents were out, me and my brother. And she took a phone call. So she walked outside and the door shut and locked behind her. So she had to go through the back and she was just shook after that. It, it was very scary for her. Um, <clears throat> we ended up moving into the house I grew up in, just a, you know, a few streets away in the same city. I'm <clears throat> from Michigan, not sure if I said that yet. So the house that I grew up in Whatever was in the first house followed my mom is what she believes. Um, essentially, this is a crazy story. I can't recall it. I was only six months old. Um, but she told me that apparently I was lifted up by whatever the spirit was. And I was floating in thin air and was taken to my mother. There was some type of spirit protecting me, um, but that bad spirit was also there um, because my mom said that she was literally stuck on her bed. Like she felt like somebody was pushing her and holding her down. And it was that same black figure with the top hat and it was very scary. So um, my grandmother also sensed it. <laughs> Um, I don't know, she wasn't psychic or anything, but she just, she knew right away that this was not good. And um, she didn't even have to see anything to believe it. Just the feelings were there. But my mom actually saw it and experienced it. And I was apparently lifted up. <laughs> I don't remember any of this. So we had a priest come to the house. After the priest left, there was no activity. I lived in that house until I went away to college. Um, when the pr When the priest showed up, Apparently, there was a brush from like the 1950s that just appeared out of thin air. My mother said that the priest was in our backyard for like hours, just blessing the home. He was in there for a very long time. And when he left, there was nothing. So, you know, whatever was stuck in that house or followed my mom to that house, you know, moved on, think thank God. But um, yeah, so that was my story. There's a lot of stories from my past. I don't remember, but I felt like I would share that. Thanks a lot. Okay. So that was some creepy shit. Okay. I need a little bit of clarification. So the first house when they sold it, is that the house we're talking about? Or that's did, what I think. Or did, had they moved and something went with them? I was thinking it was the same house. But she did at the end say something following her mom. Right. But then the priest seemed to have gotten rid of everything. Yeah. 
But how would you feel like if you bought a really haunted house and they didn't tell you? But in some now some states they do have to disclose that. There's a few states. There are. Yeah. So if that wasn't disclosed and you live in one of those states, in my state, yeah, you could sell a haunted house and not disclose it. Well, I think you could. Yeah, yeah. But I think there's yeah. like two states that, like, if it's like California. I sort of think New York. You have to let people know if the, if something has happened in the house. Like the murders. Yeah, but I think, I also think there are a few states that if there is any paranormal activity, you're supposed to to tell people. Okay, I'm Googling it. I would like to think that I could walk New Jersey, in. Okay. New York, Massachusetts, and Minnesota in those states. That's what it says. Okay. They, those four states specifically address paranormal activity in their real estate disclosure laws. Okay. But not Michigan. I wonder how many legal documents actually ever address paranormal. <laughs> I don't think probably I don't too think many. probably very many, right? So it's kind of interesting. I mean, it just goes to show you that enough things happen that legislators went, damn, we're going to have to protect people from ghosts because there's enough complaints about this, you know? Lucky for you and me, people like us, we get that spidey sense that we walk into a would, place like that and it's like, mm, yeah, I would I like to think here. that that would protect me enough from buying a house that, you know, I just have that sense. But, you know, you could walk in and it felt okay. And then, you know, in a little while, things start happening. I know with this house after closing, I was like, shit, what if this house is haunted? And then we're, we just got done signing the documents. We're walking out and I go to the girl who sold it. I'm like, is it haunted? <laughs> Please tell me it's not tell haunted. Tell me it's not haunted, is it? It doesn't feel haunted to me, but then I got to thinking about it. But like that is a different level. Mm-hmm. A the, baby floating? That is really weird. I haven't heard anything about a baby floating before. No. I don't like it. It doesn't feel safe because once she talked about the baby floating, then she was like, there was one protecting me. Right. Like, is that the one protecting you, causing you to float? Because that seems kind of reckless. I don't like that. No, that's horrifying. But, you know, whatever the priest did, he needed a bonus, even did, though I don't think a, they, they their pay rate is structured was, like that. I don't think so either, but he was excellent. It's like we're sending father john out to do the exorcism today he's like good job john you get a 500 hundred dollar bonus this month for getting well, successfully we, getting rid of the demons and we do have a lot of people that say it helps mm-hmm. you know at least for a while yeah oh and there's cases we've heard lots of stories like that too where once they did it, it was gone. Mm-hmm. And then other people are like, once it happened, then they came back. And so that's why I'm always a little confused. It's like like Brandy, her case, because those are kind of similar today. How did she successfully, almost successfully, because she mm-hmm. said she's still seeing images. Yeah. What did she do as opposed to what did he do? Uh-huh. You know? Yeah. Although that guy's got a lot of training and, you know, he's a mm-hmm. priest for crying out loud. Yeah. But and but usually, I, wouldn't you say most of the time we hear about people bringing a priest in, it helps at least for a while. And I have to, I've thought about this before. Like, does it help you in a way to, to mentally just feel a little bit more secure in your own home Mm -hmm. that you know the priest was there you know it's been blessed so your attitude might not be so scared and you might that might give you more strength Mm -hmm. too Mm -hmm. I don't know I I talked to these guys on the grave talks this weekend it's a home we could talk about that episode for days to dissect it but there's this demonic entity and I'm like does it feed off of the weak people and and I didn't even get that sentence out before they both said, no, it oh, really? feeds off everybody. Oh. And even one of the guys who has been doing paranormal investigations for years, it kind of, they said that people will be in the house and they get extremely angry. And so the guy in this house murdered his stepsister and he said, I don't know what happened. I did it, but it was like something took over me. 
And he said that house should be torn down. And he served his time. He's out of prison now, apparently. But this happened in 1979, so he spent quite a bit of time in prison. But it's really interesting. So then Dennis, who has got all this experience, he said the same thing happened to him. He's like, it was everything was fine. We're having a New Year's Eve party there, and every or maybe it might have been the house next door, but everything's fine. Mm-hmm. And there's kids, and everybody's happy, and it's a party. And then he said, all of a sudden, he was so angry, he wanted to take out his gun and start shooting people. <laughs> He's like, I don't know where that came from. Oh. And he got out of the house. The other guy went out and said, hey, dude, are you okay? He's like, no, <laughs> I'm not. Wow. Super scary place. Yeah. So living in an environment like that, I can't imagine. Right. You know, just day to day. Oh, my gosh. And the whole baby thing, like, the, the, it's random. Like, the baby mm-hmm. floating, and then the hairbrush that appeared out of nowhere. Well, and how did they know it was a 1950s hairbrush? I don't know. I still have one of Grandma's that was probably from that era, and it looks, it looks old. But I don't know. Maybe she just, because it looks old, so, okay. I don't know. Okay, so we've got one more story, and it says, this incident has troubled, this is an interesting story. So it's troubled and confused me for many years. I'd love to hear your thoughts. This happened to my wife and me in 2003. We were living in Manchester, UK at the time and had booked a holiday to tour Ontario, Canada in a mobile home. I'm going to guess in an RV. Right, that would be my guess because it would be hard to drag a mobile home around with you. Now, it might be one of those things in the UK they call those mobile homes. Here, they are secured. You don't drive those around. Um, we flew from Manchester to Philadelphia en route to Toronto. But it does sound like fun. Oh, gosh, yeah. We boarded our flight to Manchester early in the morning. The plane was only two-thirds full. They probably said yay. Uh, my wife was in the window seat. I was in the middle seat. In the aisle seat, Next to me was occupied by an elderly lady traveling alone. She appeared rather nervous, almost mildly agitated. I assumed this was due to her fear of flying, so I engaged her in conversation during takeoff. Her name was Mary. She had been widowed 12 months earlier, and she too was en route to Toronto to visit her twin sister. Soon after takeoff, probably due to this early start to get to the airport, my wife fell asleep, and soon afterward, I followed suit. We were woken several hours later by the air hostess delivering our in-flight meals. Mary's seat was vacant, so I assumed she was using the restroom. The air hostess delivered our meals and started to move off when I called her back, explaining that Mary was probably in the restroom and would she leave her meal for when she returned. Who is Mary? The hostess replied. She's the lady who was sat in the aisle seat, I explained. I'm sure that seat is unoccupied, came the reply. My wife and I were insistent that Mary had been sat there, and such was our insistence that she went off to check the seating plan. She returned several minutes later to reiterate that that seat was not taken. My wife and I discussed this, and we came to the conclusion that Mary must have sat in the wrong seat, and having realized, she moved seats whilst we slept. Something didn't feel right, and after our meal, I decided to go see if I could find Mary. As I said earlier, the flight was only two-thirds full and wasn't a particularly big plane. I wandered up and down the aisles twice. There was no sign of Mary. After about an hour, I went to look again, just in case she had been in the restroom on my first look. She was not there. My wife and I had both seen and interacted with this lady, but she was no longer on board the plane. After disembarking in Philadelphia, I scanned the leaving passengers both on the plane and in the luggage collection area. But again, there was no sign. So who was Mary? What was Mary? I can only assume she was a ghost, not a hallucination, as my wife and I had seen and talked to her. What are your thoughts, guys? Andrew. Wow, Andrew. Isn't that so creepy? That is creepy. You know, it does remind me, my dad said one time something kind of similar happened to him where, what was it, he picked up hitchhikers or something? I think he was traveling and he was really tired 
And I don't know if he had stopped someplace and met some guy who needed a ride or he picked up a hitchhiker. And this was like yeah. in the 50s yeah. or 60s. And and he drove with this guy. And, and they had talked the whole time and visited. And then I'm trying to remember they how... They stopped to get coffee. And um, so they got out and they're going to use the bathroom, get a cup of coffee. And so I think it's the middle of the night, middle of nowhere... They get out and go in, and then Dad's like, where did he go? And he's looking for the guy, and the um, the guy says, there's no, you didn't come he in He said, you walked anybody. in by yourself. What are you talking about? There's no other person, and Dad's like, no, there was another person. Yeah. And he's like, no, there was And no it one. kind of reminds me of that. Yeah. Of being with somebody and having complete conversation. Like, he knew about her twin sister in Toronto and, and you she'd know, been widowed. widowed for a, month, a year and you know all these things I mean they had a full her name convers- was Mary they had a full conversation right and so how does a ghost end up on a plane you know it's like was it just or, s- or was it that yeah you know because I highly doubt that she died on the plane. Maybe she did. And maybe that she was traveling and that's kind of her residual yeah. thing that she just keeps repeating. Yeah. Isn't that fascinating? Though? Yeah. Yeah, but it does remind me of the dad's story where he was the same way. He was with somebody, had a complete conversation, and then that person disappears in kind of a way like that's not alarming like you fell asleep and when you woke up they weren't there oh they went to the bathroom yeah could you leave a meal for mary and dad walks into this little diner the guy goes to the bathroom and he doesn't and then they go you walked in by yourself we don't know what you're talking about very interesting yeah so my thoughts are it happens my thoughts are that happened they had some kind of paranormal encounter with mary now where mary came from did did she? Maybe she did pass away on the plane. And, but That's why did, happened? But my question is, why did Mary pick them mm-hmm. to talk to and to sit with? It's it's as if she picked them, or was that the seat she died in? But it just—I've never really heard about a plane being haunted, but it sure could be. Or is there just this random kind of time space thing where mm-hmm. Mary just found them, and I don't and, know. But it is, it it is interesting, and it is as if she chose them, or th- that they could see her, yeah. for some reason. But no one else on the plane did. No, and the air hostess was like, "What are you talking about?" Yeah, oh, that was mm. crazy. I wish I could explain that, Andrew. I can't, but I loved that story. So if you have a real ghost story, we want to hear it. Call it in eight five five eight five three four eight zero two. Write it in at realghoststoriesonline.com. And if you want an ad-free version of the show, you get advanced episodes, access to the archive. You can become a premium subscriber through Apple Podcasts. You could also sign up through patreon.com slash realghoststories or ghostpodcast.com. And for all of us here at Real Ghost Stories Online, thank you for listening.